Live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into... And, let's try that again. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I am your host, Ben. I'm your co-host, Carissa. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So everyone, welcome into today's program. Uh, even though it's not Tuesday, we have a special show planned for you. Uh, and this is going to be a... Uh, going to be an interesting one and i'm not sure what's going to happen when it comes to uh the fallout of this i'm betting nothing so let's hope for that one but we are going to be talking about uh yeah the chinese social credit system we touched on it lately yesterday here on the show i thought it was a pretty good topic and you know what uh, yeah, we're going to get further into it. And, you know, there's going to be some clarifying here. It's not uh, it's not as bad as it could be currently. You know, we're going to kind of put this into perspective, what is actually going on versus what could happen. But there is still going to be some what could happen here in this as well. We're going to try to give you the best information that we can uh, and that we looked up. So everyone, uh, sit back, relax, enjoy the show. Uh, also, ComputerAmerica.com, that's where you'll find everything, including past shows, future shows shows you'll also find uh, links to any articles that we have uh, any resources that we pull from today we will be sure to include them in the show notes which you can find at our website with that being said, uh, check out the podcast. It's uh, our show rebroadcast in a portable format if you can't catch us live here on the air. And uh, yeah, find us, find us on social media, uh, Computer America. Carissa, how you doing? Pretty okay. How are you? Not bad, not bad. Uh, oh, and actually, I, I should probably start mentioning this as well. Uh, next month or next month next week here on the show next week uh yeah there will be no new computer america for the last week of october i will be out so yeah here we are uh so everyone we will have reruns and best ofs all that week and then uh the following week the first week in november we will be back to our regular to our regular regularly scheduled programming so don't panic Excellent. everyone exactly so i'm excited uh yeah Time off is always fun. I mean, I, I, I definitely enjoy doing the show. So I'm not, uh, you know, I'm like, oh, man, thank goodness I'm, I, I can get out of here. Uh, no, I honestly enjoy doing this and talking with everyone and sharing interesting topics and ideas. Uh, I, I enjoy that. But, you know, life, you have to live it. And you have yeah. to go do things and get out of the office. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm not saying that I'm like, you know, man, I can't wait for it. But it, it's it's going to happen. So I just want to make sure everyone is prepared. Now, with that being said, uh, Chris, unless you have anything else to talk about, I think we can go ahead and jump right into our topic for the day. Let's go for it. Uh, by the way, Carissa, your next job uh, after the show is to find a little jingle about 10 seconds long Ooh. for music that we can play for segments like these. Because, again, all I have is... All right. But that's for that news. Down. And this isn't exactly news. So we have right. to find a little 10 second jingle that we can play and make sure that, uh, yeah, 
there you go. So, uh, with that being said, as I said before, the Chinese social credit system. That will be today's topic, and that will take up hopefully the entire show. And whatever we don't, you know, uh, any time that we have left over, we'll do computer and technology news. But hey, we talked about this a little bit on, I may have misspoken earlier, we talked about this on Monday. And uh, I have since mentioned it to people in my personal life, you know, uh, friends and family and whatnot. And I thought this was pretty common, that everyone knew this was happening. And, you know, uh, Carissa, not knowing about it here on the air, was like, uh, you know, what she was the odd one out. But turns out that she was actually a very good barometer for pretty much everyone else that I know that, you know, the covering of the social credit system just has not really penetrated to a wider audience. So let's talk about that. And uh, Carissa, I'm going, to, I'm going to go ahead and put you on the spot just to uh, gauge what you recall from a couple of days ago. Uh, just broad strokes, do you recall what the social credit system is? Like, could you quickly describe what the system is and does? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a system where the government kind of has control over, you know, your livelihood based on how good of a citizen they think you are. So depending on your actions that you take within the city and with your neighbors and things like that can dictate whether or not you can get credit or a job or a bus pass or things like that. So it's certainly elements of that for sure. And uh, this is going to be a pretty dense topic, but think in, in social credit definitely implies something that like we have here in the United States and many Western countries, which is your credit score. And one could argue banks have the same control over people to a certain extent. You know, banks get to decide if you are worthy of having a home, a car loan, if you can rent, if you can do any, you know, many of these things that we kind of take for granted that, you know, one day if you work through the ranks, you too can build up a good credit score and, you know, be able to buy that fancy new patio furniture set that you just so desperately want. Uh, yeah, banks get to decide if you have that or not, which is almost in some ways, uh, you know, could be a little bit more concerning because that's not, you know, there's no oversight. They're private industries and, you know, who really monitors the credit system. So, uh, but we're not here to talk about the credit system. We're talking about the social credit system by China and it rolls all of that into, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it takes all of that and rolls in as well your behaviors, your actions, uh, the way others perceive you, the way that you behave towards others, the way you travel, uh, how you keep yourself, all that kind of thing. And it's almost like a fun little number that the government gets to portray you as either a good citizen or a bad citizen. And the problem really extends to the fact that there are tangible consequences for being a bad citizen, quote unquote. And so I wanted to start off this whole topic with this article directly from uh, China, the government of China, and they have put out a new article. They actually released this in June of this. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That was the uh, that was the beginning of it, and it's been updated in 2020. So they put this out June 2014. Uh, it's been updated every year since, and you know it's been kind of added to, which you could definitely uh, tell by the length of it, and we're going to do our best to kind of plug through this, but I thought no better place to start than the Chinese government's own words and kind of what it, what it is aiming to do. So, with that being said, we'll start here, and again, this is from the uh, China's own government website, saying the outline, and this is the outline of the social credit system construction plan. So, uh, social credit exists in a couple of forms, and one thing I should probably really emphasize is that a lot of the covers that has happened in Western media are possibilities, what could happen. And it's not that far of a stretch to take what is currently happening and extrapolate it to its next logical conclusion. But at the same time, you, uh, the social credit system is still very much in its planning phase. It's very almost like in alpha, if you can consider in like software terms. Uh, it's not implemented widely anywhere. Multiple private, and I'd say private with quotation marks because they are encouraged and overseen by the government. 
Uh, private industries are, you know, implementing their own social credit scores. And the idea is that eventually, um, the government, you know, like whatever they approve and whatever works and whatever they find to be worthy of escalating to a full blown, uh, national policy, they have, they are going to like right now, private companies are sucking up tons of personal data, building up these databases, that kind of thing. So the government right now is not really tracking this kind of stuff, but whatever is going to be implemented will be handed over to the government. So even though the government is not collecting the personal data, the personal data is being collected for the government, I guess is a way to put that. So it, it's happening, but at the same time, it's not really happening. So right now they're still planning it, they're building it. And I think pre-COVID, Carissa, they were they were hoping to get this fully implemented. They said by the year 2020, I think COVID threw mm. a monkey wrench into a lot of this. Uh, and in some cases, probably accelerated a, a number of the parts of the system because so much business and so much commerce and communication went online due to COVID that I'm sure that certain parts of this were actually uh, helped by the virus. But oh, it was definitely, definitely. thrown up. Uh, I'm sorry? I was saying it definitely. Yeah. And, and certain parts of it were probably thrown off track. So with that being said, Directly from the Chinese government, the social credit system is an important part of the socialist market economy system and social governance system. It is based on laws, regulations, standards, and contracts based on sound credit record and credit infrastructure network covering social members supported by credit information compliance applications and credit service systems to establish a culture. And here's the part, you know, so, so many times here in America, it's like, you know, land of the free. We don't have a lot of regulations on, you know, kind of personal uh, liberties. As long as you don't kill anyone or hurt anyone, uh, by golly, you can do whatever you want. That is America. That's great. Uh, but here, explicitly stated in their, I guess, end user license agreement of sorts for the social credit system to establish a culture of integrity and promote the tradition of uh, integrity virtue uh, as an inherent requirement and trustworthy incentives and untrustworthy constraints are used as rewards and punishments. So yes, punishments are directly baked into what this is. You know, it's not just, it's not just the carrot. There's, there's stick to go along with this as well. Uh, the purpose is to improve the integrity and credit level of the whole society, which I guess what they mean there is that by everyone eventually falling under this, then everyone benefits from it. You know, uh, it, it, it's not collective punishment, but it is collective, I guess, improvement is what they're saying. Uh, so skipping down a little bit, uh, the first tenant he that they have here, and trust me, this whole article is like 50 pages long. We're not going to get through it. We're going to start skimming and talking about other topics. But the overall idea of building the social credit system, as per the government, uh, they say that it's... Uh, they said relevant regions, departments, and units have explored and promoted, and uh, and positive progress has been made has been made in the construction of the social credit system. The state council established the inter uh, the interministerial joint conference system uh, for the establishment of the credit system. Blah blah blah. Essentially, what they're saying there is that uh, every province and uh, I, I uh, Krista, do you know how large China is? Just, you know, just kind of give people an idea how large I mean, China is. It's massive. It's like the whole, just about all of Asia. Yeah, it's it's huge. It's, uh, to put a little bit into perspective, you're looking at three point, uh, I'm sorry, 3,705 million square miles, uh, which, I mean, compare that to the United States, you're looking at um, about the same size as the United States. And, and don't forget, that's including Alaska in there as well, all in one mm -hmm. contiguous uh, landmass. It's it, it, it's an absolutely huge portion of the world with a population about four times the size of the United States. Uh, this is one of the most interesting things that I've, I have come to realize about the social credit system is that every province, and I think there are like 
eight or nine different provinces in China. I'm sure someone could correct me on that. But uh, yeah, there are multiple provinces in China. Each one has their own system that they're putting in place. Many, many companies within those provinces are trying to handle this. But think about it, Chris. You have parts of China that are still living rural third world lives that are still in, you know, kind of mud huts and mud infrastructure, little to no, you know, actual infrastructure, no internet whatsoever, still right. farming, hunting, you know, hunter gatherer type uh, cultures. And they're being told by, you know, people as far away as like a thousand miles or 1500 miles away. Oh, by the way, these people have cameras everywhere and they're, you know, you know, telling everyone to behave their best or else the government's going to uh, do X to them. Like, the diversity of economic situations within China are vast. You have pretty progressive cities and very rural, remote countrysides, and they're hoping to apply these principles, carte blanche across the board, everyone falls under this. It's a very... It's going to be a very rocky road when you tell people who have never even seen a computer, hey, by the way, uh, everything you do is being tracked by computers. And they're going to go, I don't know what that means. And it has no effect on me. <laughs> right. So with that being said, China, very, very different. And they're hoping to bring every single province and, uh, and everything like that. So let's see. Although some progress has been made in the constructions of the social credit system, the contradictions that do not match, coordinate, and adapt – to the level of economic development and social development are still prominent. The main problems include the credit. Uh, yeah, it, and by the way, hello everyone listening to us live on IRN. Thank you so much. Uh, they said that the problems <laughs> include the credit information system covering the whole society has not yet been formed. That's a very important part. Again, multiple cities, multiple, pro or, I'm sorry, multiple companies, multiple provinces, multiple databases, multiple everything. Like they're still working on what's working best, but whatever does work best is going to then be adopted by the government. So it's not implemented yet, but it's implemented to some extent and it will be implemented sometime in the future in part or in whole by one of these. So it's not yet been formed. The credit records of social members are seriously lacking and the trustworthiness incentives and punishment mechanism are not perfect. The trustworthiness incentive is insufficient and the cost of trustworthiness is low. The credit service market is underdeveloped and the system is immature, irregular services, behaviors, blah, blah, blah. So they're saying that, you know, they just much like a credit report, they don't have a credit history and they're having trouble really identifying what is, uh, what should go on your record and how and how much it should affect your record. Uh, Chris, I think that one of the big problems with where China is currently at in implementing, I'm sorry, in implementing this, which they really want to do, but I, I mean, put yourself in the shoes of a Chinese citizen. Yeah, you know, it's a uh, it, it it's a tool you've heard about it you know it's this number and there are parts of it starting to formulate in your everyday life but overall you know when when we have talked about some of the orwellian measures i mean chris do you, do you think that as a person you can take these seriously and still live kind of a day-to-day -day life i think so i mean i feel like it's a lot of obviously you know them just deciphering which actions are proper to be doing and things like that, which kind of limits you on your autonomy. But it, it I mean, don't be a bunghole. <laughs> you know? Very well put. Yeah. It, it, it's very much, I think feels like to most Chinese citizens, to people living there. And uh, these are, this is just from the research that I've done. A lot of the citizens don't feel like this is something that's actually going to happen. Uh, and if it is, it's far off in the distant future and it's going to change a lot and it's not really a thing. So when they hear about West, you know, kind of Western knee jerk reaction, this is the, you know, this is the end of the free autonomous people in China. Uh, the people living, the, you know, going to work nine to five, you know, they have a house, they have kids, they're, you know, they're doing their thing. Uh, they get to go to the bars, they get to go to the places that they like. Nothing things really change, they look at the coverage and they go, well, you know, they're, they're wrong. Nothing like that is happening. 
even though the system is being put in place, the actual repercussions of the system are not there. So the average right. citizen doesn't really believe this is going to happen, or at least it's not going to be in any form that is being covered. And also don't forget, they're also not seeing a lot of the cover, a lot of the Western coverage of politics and insights into China, because there's the great firewall of China, which we'll touch mm-hmm. on a little bit later. So anyways, uh, they have a whole thing about situation requirements, guiding, uh, guiding ideology, uh, which again, the main objective is to, uh, elevate everyone by trying to encourage good social behavior and good citizen behavior among its citizens. You know, if everyone is better, if everyone is more trustworthy, if people who are dishonest are punished, then everyone is better as a society. Now, obviously, the system, even as they admit, is not perfect and very, very much prone to uh, gaming the system. So, okay, uh, let's see. So the article continues. I think it's really going to, like, you know, depend on how how severe these punishments are. You know, like if they're just off the wall punishments for minor things, then maybe they'll be a little more upset about it. But uh, like we we have that here, where if you jaywalk, you get a ticket for fifty bucks. Uh, it's just there. If you jaywalk, your you know your pun you know your credit score goes down by you know five points or whatever, and that may not be that big of a deal. But a lifetime of jaywalking and all these other offenses, which we're going to talk about some of the other offenses you can get get in trouble for, a lifetime of those puts you into a different class within society. Like it's not rich versus right. poor at that point. It's trustworthy and untrustworthy citizens. Are you a blacklisted person or are you one of the privileged whitelisted people? Mm. And you know, kind of how you got there is going to matter or like how you got there is going to matter less and less. And either that's by some random government, uh, creed, you know, creed saying this person is now blacklisted or whatever. I mean, yeah, we have those checks and balances for being a, a decent person here. They're called fines and tickets. And, you know, of course, just the social pressure of if you're a, if you're a, mean person in public someone's gonna whip out their phone punch you in the face and post it on world star hip-hop you know it's just it's just what's gonna happen in in america in china they're looking to formalize something much more uh rigid and kind of legal and have a legal framework built around it so uh again scrolling through this article there's a lot here and yeah if you're super interested in this kind of thing this is the one for you. Uh, they have like credit construction of natural persons, credit construction uh, for internet applications and services. So you even have social credit scores of companies and services, uh, such as online banking and things like that. Uh, companies will have their own social credit system to encourage them to be, you know, kind of uh, more generous with people and donate and you know whatever essentially your business can be shut down if you're if you you as a person perfectly okay if you do bad business practices uh your business could be shut down under the same rules of of this it's very very Mm -hmm. wide reaching and affects every legal entity in china which you know there you go uh, let's see. So with that being said, I, and they're talking about everything from judicial system. How do you actually judge these kinds of things and who keeps track of it and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think we're going to go ahead and switch articles from this, but I did find this very interesting that this was, this was the, the party itself, the people's Republic of China and the central government stating we are building the social credit system and here's our plan and here's what we're going for and here's what we're doing so that that is as close to the source material as you're going to get now that's a good overview we can talk about some of these other things here uh let's see i found a couple of these articles this one uh, let's see unfortunately a lot of these if i'm mistranslating any of these i blame google uh they are luckily providing a lot of the translation because a number a number of these publications are in china in in chinese so now that was the social credit system the next topic that we had to cover here were kind of what affects your score and i found this was this was the part that i think grabs people's attention because 
your social credit system, I mean, if you default on a loan, if you book something and you don't show up, if you do some kind of business transaction in good faith and you don't hold up your end, that's clearly going to affect your social, you know, your social credit. But what else does? And this is the part where you can really fine tune it, tweak it. These are what the municipalities in China are really working on. You know, how effectively can we track if someone pushes someone out of the way when they're trying to board a train? Uh, you know, are the cameras set up all over China capable of, ident- of identifying that person and saying this person did something rude? Let's deduct some points from them. Things like that. So this store, uh, we're going to do this one, this one from uh, politics.people.com for or dot China. So from China's people, politics, whatever. They said that uh, a reporter learned from the, from the Municipal Transportation Commission that in order to maintain the order of rail transit operations and ensure the safety of rail trans- transit operations, uh, they begin uh, issued a review of the Beijing Rail Transit Passenger Code, herefore referred to as the Passenger Code, and essentially saying they are implementing personal credit information to uncivilized riding behavior in rail transit. It's saying that uh, prior to this, they had the implementation opinions were uh, publicly solicited opinions from the public, which received extensive attention and active participation from the public, and some construction opinions were fully adopted. Essentially, they went to people riding trains and said, what do you hate about people who ride trains? Imagine doing that in New York City and saying, what do you hate? And I bet you would be like mariachi bands, buskers, street performers, and weirdos. And I, I'm, I'm sure you would throw in like homeless people as well, sleeping on trains. Uh, they did the same thing in China, and they even formalized some of those into what goes into the passenger code. So... They said that on one hand, it added content such as not to eat in the carriage, one person occupying multiple seats, so if you lay across multiple seats, uh, at the same time, privately posting hanging items, which I guess would be like flyers and pamphlets, promoting products or engaging in marketing, uh, that would be, you know, hey, I got this watch, you want to buy this watch, it's five, you know, it's normally $1,300 Rolex uh, for you, five bucks, things like that, Uh, that would be construed as a bad thing, uh, promoting products or engaging in marketing and using folding bicycles, automatic Mm. balance vehicles, and various scooters in stations and carriages. So using your hoverboard in the train, I guess, is also looked down upon. Uh, On the one hand, the original payment has been modified to add content such as prohibiting e-cigarettes. Yeah, you can't vape. No more vaping in trains. Uh, Smoking, staying in the evacuation pass passage for a long time. So, you know, kind of uh, staying in the doorway of the train system and not moving, and, you know, kind of obstructing other people from leaving the train, taking a cool bath, um, <laughs> taking a cool bath. So, uh, like I said, this is done through Google the Translate. translation. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there was a translation. Uh, I can imagine... Maybe uh, bathing in public, something like that. You know, some people pull out the wet wipes and they, you know, kind of go at it. Oh, uh, yeah. something, something like that, I'm sure, is what they meant. Lying down, using forged tickets and violating uh, escalators or, you know, using escalators in the wrong manner, passages, uh, passages and other prohibited signs. Uh, Carissa, all of that is obviously bad. But I guess, again, the point here is that they want to formalize it and say, all that's so bad, it's going to affect your social credit. Well, I mean, yeah, that stuff is kind of bad. And that does sound kind of nice being able to get on a train where like that stuff's just not going to happen. And you can just have a relaxing ride on the train. But it's interesting. A little extreme. Well, I gotta stop using the word interesting. I'm, I'm using it too much. It's different because, like I said, so many people are so removed from modern life in China. Like I said, uh, fifth, uh, let's see how many people, uh, Chris, you look up this number. How many people live in China, uh, Chinese cities versus the country and, you know, uh, rural versus urban. Uh, So find out that number for me. But anyways, Chinese people who are from rural parts of the country have no idea how to ride a train. They see others, but then they don't know that, oh, eating things 
in you know surrounded by a bunch of people may be rude because they just don't really know so right. uh yeah it, it, it's it's formalizing rules that everyone has to conform to but people just don't know in a lot of cases uh All right, i have your number yeah uh, lay it on 80- 831 million people lived in urban regions in China and 564 million in rural in 2018. So let's say six, uh, 60-40 or like 70-30, you know, mostly city, but still a good 500 million, more than yeah, the population <laughs> of the United States lived in rural places that do not have, you know, many of the modern conveniences and rules and governing like, uh, like people are used to. So, Yeah, you have 500 million people that may, you know, in passing come for business or come to see family or things like that and just not behave uh, accordingly. And they're going to be obviously judged on this. They said, and to continue on with their point here, some of the consequences that can get your social credit score reduced on trains, for instance. Uh, Uncivilized ride behaviors that record personal credit information include fare evasion. So not okay. paying for your ticket, seat occupation, laying down, eating on the train, promoting marketing, playing video games or music loudly. Uh, they also measure to discourage uncivilized ride behaviors. They have a right to refuse uh, to provide ride services and report to public to public security and traffic law enforcement about who did it and what you did, and you know, kind of record bad personal credit information due to the uncivilized behavior. Uh, Let's see, I think, and, and they formalized it, they put all of that in the code here, and you can read it here if you're riding trains in China, you might want to take a look at that, but, but, this is the result of all of that, and I got the article right here, this is from CBC uh, in Canada, this is the blacklist, and this, this is what, this is the end result of that, saying that, uh, the National Public Credit Information Center revealed its annual report that people with low scores have been blocked from buying 17.5 million airline tickets in 2018. In 2018 alone, people were barred from buying train tickets 5.5 million times, and 120 people were blocked from leaving the country due to unpaid taxes, which... Uh, you know, when we're talking about millions and then they hit us with a 128 figure, it's kind of like, oh, that's pretty neat. So it turns out that they're much more, and and I guess what they could say there is that, you know, not that everyone pays their taxes, but more that they're taking the social credit system seriously. Additionally, there were almost 300,000 instances where a person's low score stopped them from getting a senior management job or acting as a company's legal representative, saying that if you're on one of these blacklists, you are barred from buying luxury goods on some of China's online shopping platform, and you can't buy a plane ticket, you can't get a mortgage. That's what they, you know, that's what they were talking about. So with that being said, while low score can limit your chances of getting a government job, they point out that under the system, citizens can also receive rewards for good behavior because again, it's not all bad, but you know, there are some good perks to being uh, a good citizen in China. Uh, let's see. So they said in some places, if you're on a blacklist, there's been experiments where the government will automatically change your cell phone ringtone. Uh, that's actually, I, I never heard about that, but that's, uh, that's, that's pretty, yeah. So I guess if someone calls you and you get like the, da, 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 yep, you are right. on the blacklist, I guess. And, you know, and, and the government, the government changed your ringtone so that everyone publicly knows, oh, that person's phone who's ringing, they're a bad person. <laughs> Public shame. They said that if your friend calls you, instead of hearing a phone ringing, they get a message saying that this person's on the blacklist as a method of public shaming, as we just said. So not, <laughs> not, not, not a different ringtone, but a message. Uh, wow. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, let's see. So, and, and, and one thing to really point out there was that a lot of these are experiments. They're ongoing experiments by different uh, companies and provinces, and you know, and some like like they said, in some places, if you're on the blacklist, there have been experiments. Those are happening everywhere. There's not a uniform response to the social credit system yet. They're testing it on millions of people, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't, and then they are going to implement this nationwide. That is fully their intent, but it's not there yet. I want to make that very clear. 
Uh, they say that social credit scores have been very effective, and this is just continuing off this article. Uh, obviously, Human Rights Watch called the system to create a reality in which bureaucratic pettiness could significantly limit people's rights. Uh, but one legal expert says that fears are overblown. Uh, so one other thing I should kind of point out from inside the country, Carissa, it seems like everyone's saying, oh, either it's not going to happen, it's not that bad, don't worry about it, you know, there are good things, the system, you know, only affects people who are doing bad things, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, don't forget, you can't speak bad about the Chinese government, because that would lower your social credit uh, system, or, you know, I'm sorry, your score, and criticism of the government is unfortunately kind of what we're looking for here. We're not looking for praising of what the government is doing. We're looking for criticisms, the, the drawbacks, the negatives, what are what is currently not working. And right now, voicing that opinion of what's not working is punished under the system. Which well, Especially when you have so many cameras, like that photo just right there, you know, like you're being watched all the time. So anything you do well, or say, they're going to hear anyway. Let's so. let's talk about that real quick, because that's something that I think uh, others don't really know. And it's OK. So tons of different stuff that we have here. One of the topics we had was this Wikipedia article, of course, you know, Wikipedia being what it is. Uh, but still, Wikipedia, mass surveillance in China. And it's talking about a network of monitoring systems used by the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, to supervise the lives of Chinese citizens under uh, Xi Jinping's administration. And there have been many instances where you have local companies like Tencent, which we talked about yesterday mm -hmm. with the video games, Tencent, uh, Dehua Technology, Hikvision, SenseTime, ByteDance. We talked a lot about ByteDance with TikTok. Uh, Meg V, Huawei, and ZTE. Huawei and ZTE have been banned from the United States for a couple of years now. And ZTE, I think, got kicked out of the European Union as well. So, uh, among many others, as of 2019, it's estimated that they were about... I'm going to let you go ahead and guess this, Krista. Yes, it's on my screen. Yes, you probably read it. But can you guess how many CCT cameras are implemented in the quote-unquote Skynet system in mainland oh, China? Oh, no. A uh, billion. Uh, you know, actually, you overestimated for once. 200 oh. million CCT cameras. That's still a lot of cameras. It's a lot. But I also have another number to throw out there to put it into perspective. But let's see. Uh... I'm not going to tell everyone, uh, but I have an, uh, another number that is a little, uh, a little related. Anyways, mass surveillance, 200 million cameras in China, four times the number of surveillance cameras in the United States, which may also wow. be surprising to people. There are 50 million CCT cameras in the United States to monitor us, you know, either for law enforcement or for whatever it may be. Uh, yeah, there's still 50 million there. Now, th the most camera or place that has the most security cameras in the world is London. Guess how many cameras are in London alone, Carissa? Oh, my God. And it's more than anywhere else? More than anywhere else. More uh, than any other city. Oh, man, I don't know. Uh, I keep wanting to say a billion, but that's, I feel like that's too no, many. No, 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 um, no, no, no. Hund Hundreds of thousands. It's hundreds in the of hun thousands. Let's do, let's do uh, 700,000. Closer, probably because I gave you a hint. But 500,000 cameras in London alone. It is the oh, most wow. monitored city in in the world that is of course due to a string of terror attacks and terrorist uh threats and bomb attempts and uh so many things that happen in london that they really want to get a grip on this uh so yeah you know uh china has a lot of cameras it is the most monitored country overall london the most monitored city so don't think this kind of thing just happens in other countries but yeah it's huge Oh, and uh, actually, I lied. I lied. I lied. I lied. They updated. That was 2019. You're looking at 200 million cameras. By 2020, that number increased to 626 million. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. It tripled in a single year to 600 million cameras. 
So if you really think about that, by hey, by, by next year, you could be looking at almost a billion cameras, which again, don't, you know, COVID definitely accelerated a number of these, especially if you have to monitor where people are going to track the virus and do uh, social distancing mm. and quarantining. I'm. I would not be surprised if they were at by twenty sometime in twenty twenty one if they were at a billion cameras across the country, which would really almost be one camera for every single person in the country. Uh, you know, just to kind of put that into perspective. Now, uh, so yeah, that's the mass surveillance in China, and of course that goes all the way back to the Maoist era back in nineteen forty nine. They've always been about that. Uh, you know, ever, ever since the Reformation period in China, and. Yeah, by 2020, according to official government, the Chinese government aims to build a nationwide video surveillance network for ensuring public security, which will be omnipresent, fully networked, working all the time, and fully controllable. These are things said by the government. This is not just some random stuff that is being speculated on and conjectured. No, the government itself is saying, here's what we're going to do. Uh, This is why so many tech companies based in China are put under such scrutiny. You know, uh, when they talk about the surveillance and, you know, kind of pooling of data like TikTok, for instance, uh, it's because it's it's mandated by the government. You know, they make them pull all that kind of information constantly and all the time. Right. Uh, so, uh, and that's just video cameras that we, we've been talking about. There's a whole thing with ISPs, with data, with uh, services, servers, so on and so forth. It's it's this whole thing. Uh, I did want to touch on this one section of this mass surveillance in China article, saying that in connection with the camera surveillance, they have been developing social credit system, as we've been talking about. Uh, after capturing people's activities and identifying them through facial recognition techniques, the government links their activities to their personal credit rating so that the information is stored in a quantifiable and measurable way. Under the system, people, their identities, and their actions are connected to a citizen score. Many Chinese citizens have already started using the the Sesame Credit uh, system, which is actually not operated by Alibaba. That's a mistake. It's operated by something else. Uh, But anyways, many Chinese citizens have already started using the Sesame Credit uh, system. Uh, It's designed so that those with good credit can live a more convenient life than those with low scores. Again, creating that kind of caste system in society. Two different kinds of rules for two different kinds of people. Uh, They even say that, for instance, people with high credit scores do not need to pay deposits when checking in at hotels and can obtain visas more quickly than others. On the other hand, people with low credit scores cannot easily eat at restaurants, register at hotels, purchase products, or travel freely. Again, all a symptom of the social credit system. So, with that being said, and of course, one of the biggest uses of video surveillance in China is which province, Carissa? Uh, probably Beijing. Wrong. Uh, good, good guess though. <laughs> no, uh, 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 Xinjiang. Uh, Xin, mm. Xinjiang, which is of course with the Uyghurs and, and the whole uh, Muslim oh. population and mass incarceration, uh, that whole thing. So yeah, they have the most amount of cameras and security. And of course, they also track people's phones as well. You know, uh, we haven't mentioned anything about phones. Yes, they track phones as well. Now, Which I'm sure goes into the microphones and the cameras within yes. the phones oh, and all that for stuff sure, too. For sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. It's Batman. It's Batman's uh, super thing. You know, The Dark Knight Returns with, uh, uh, or I should say, The Dark Knight with uh, Morgan Freeman and the whole thing. It's that <laughs> on steroids. Uh, it's not a 3D imaging map, but yeah, they can turn your microphone on whenever they want. So uh, that's what affects your score. It's not just trains, it's also just everything about you that they can, anything that they can quantifiably say, this is Ben, this is what he does and how he acts, that's going to affect your score one way or the other. And it's not even just what I do, it's who I associate with, what I think, what I say, what I believe, how good of a person am I being as they see fit. Yeah, it's Like even in your own home? Yes. Well, I guess with the phones, yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. 
And so, and by the way, you also included this, also known as Sesame Credit, is a private credit scoring and loyalty program system developed by the Ant Financial Services, an affiliate of the Chinese Alibaba Group, but it's not owned by the, the Alibaba Group, which I saw that correction uh, in one of our other articles here. Yeah, uh, that was improperly put in place. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. I have this other... Uh, Okay, let's go ahead and continue on here with the show notes. Uh, one thing I wanted to kind of point out here, again, just the, the the incompleteness of what we're talking about. Some of the local policies that are put in place, and these are for, again, the social credit system in China, Beijing, Shanghai, uh, uh, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Hangzhou, Nan, uh, Nanjing, Shouzhou, Jinan. I'm sure I messed all of those up. I apologize to anyone who actually can't speak Chinese. Anyways, these are some of the policy, the local policies that uh, they put into place, such as Hangzhou. We talked about this the other day. Individuals and organizations who do not comply with waste sorting rules of the city will receive a negative record on their credit scores and have to pay cor- a corresponding amount of fine. Others include uh, 25 types of resident behavior will cost a drop in their credit scores, including, Carissa, check this one out. We haven't mentioned this one yet on the show, cheating in online video games. Dang it. Yeah. Making Nothing reservations. Nothing is sacred. I know. Cheating is a time-honored tradition. Making reservations at hotels and restaurants but not showing up, failing to pay your bills promptly, failing to pick up takeout food orders, and on the other hand, of course, as we mentioned, blood donations and volunteer work will increase your score. Uh, Let's see. So, starting in January 1st, 2017, dog owners lose three points for keeping their dogs off-leash in public places, allowing their dogs to disturb other people, not cleaning up after their dogs. Yes, even something like not picking up your dog poop uh, will affect your social credit standing. They also say that owners lose another three points on the second offense. They lose all 12 points for the third time and banned from owning a dog for the period of five years if they lose all 12 points. So there you go. Wow. Uh, dog o- Dogs of owners with zero points are confiscated by the government until the owner takes uh, takes free courses on relevant city rules and passes. Yeah, they will literally rip your puppy out of your arms until you figure out how to become a better citizen. Uh, it's so This is so weird. But yeah, these are things that are actually happening. But again, by province, it's these are these are the testing grounds. These are the beta features. These are you know what works, what doesn't. Maybe taking people's dogs won't work, and it will not be adopted nationwide. But currently, it's being tried. So uh, now, with that being said, just below that, you have the implications, and we have everything from the travel ban already mentioned, uh, exclusion from school admissions. We talked about that with private institutions. And universities getting, you know, getting a good degree isn't just about being able to pay tuition and, you know, kind of passing your entrance exam, uh, but it's also about your credit system and also your parents' credit system. It could be no fault of yours, Carissa. If your parents have a poor social credit standing, you could not get into university oh, because of what fair. your parents did. Well, hey, that's life. Social status, as we mentioned, that puts you into a whole nother category of people. Repression of, of religious mi- minorities. We talked about the Uyghurs and the Muslim population in China. Debt collection. They said that they have a map of deadbeat debtors within 500 meters and encourage users to report individuals who they believe could repay their debts. They're using their citizens as constant watchdogs and saying, hey, I saw... Ben, with his $18 billion in debt, the other day I saw him at the restaurant ordering two bowls of food. He can totally repay that debt. I don't know why he's not paying it. Uh, yeah, they're encouraging their fellow citizen to uh, report activities that would you know, kind of indicate that they could repay their debt, but they're choosing not to. Um Public display, we mentioned mugshots of blacklisted individuals are sometimes displayed on large LED screens on buildings or shown before the movie in movie theaters. (laughs) Imagine that, sitting down to watch a movie and there's your screen because you didn't pick up enough dog poop. That's you. But they let you in the movie theater? I I know that in some places they would probably reject you from being able to buy a movie theater ticket, but 
there you go. Uh, <laughs> they also have other, uh, the rewards of having a high score include easier access to loans. We talked about all that. Uh, the immediate negative consequences for a low score or being associated to someone with a low score range from lower internet speeds. Yeah, they will lower your internet speeds because you aren't a good person to being denied access to certain jobs, loans, and visas. Every time they tack on one more little thing, like, oh, by the way, we'll cut your internet speed. It's so strange. I love it. Uh, And then, of course, for businesses, you know, there's the whole regulation for business side, blah, blah, blah. Now, uh, public opinion, they have approval. Obviously, the China... Turns out the China Institute of, In- of International Studies published an article saying that, hey, this is great. Black Blacklists do not uh, extend beyond the limits of the law, and everyone loves it. Uh, they've seen amazing work, and it looks like the China Institute of International Studies increased their score by X amount because they published something like that. Anyways, criticism. All these here... Uh, we can talk about some of those in just a bit, but I wanted to also talk about uh, this article right here, which is actually one we just referenced with the mass surveillance and that kind of thing. Uh, now, here's the part where I've been kind of hammering time and time again. It's not implemented, and it may never be fully implemented, but we have to realize, and this is, this quote is what I love. And it's, uh, here we go. While the West may view the social credit system as a form of state repression tool, they argue that it isn't shared everywhere in China. From the Chinese perspective, they see this as a form of social management, essentially being able to say that with 1.4 billion people, this is a way that you can almost instantly say that, you know, someone within your country is trustworthy or not, because it's just too many people. You you just can't associate with everyone and know who they are. So this is actually a way of discerning who's trustworthy and who is not. Now, however, they suggest that the system may be impossible to implement across a country as vast as China. With slowing growth in China, this needs a lot of resources to fully implement this. And where's that money coming from? I think people are going to question whether it's okay to spend that much money on social credit. Uh, They said that essentially, this is a tool for, uh, it's a tool for uh, suppression, but not repression. So you can suppress free speech, you can suppress what people do, that kind of thing. But it's it's not currently at the moment, it's not a way for these countries to strictly uh, punish individuals. It's a way to kind of broadly uh, promote actions that they approve and denounce actions they don't approve, but it's not going to target individuals at this moment. So right. that's where we're at right now. Um, let's see, going back to the show notes here. I mean, um, I guess it makes sense if there's that many people in one spot, you know, uh, 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 you know, like it has, I can see how it does have some you know, logical reasons behind it. I, I really do feel like if it had more of the positives, you know, saying that like, Hey, you know, uh, we, we have seen this before with other programs, like let's say in, in the United States, and I'm trying to think of, of particular ones. Anyways, if, if it was more carrot and less stick, if it were more, oh, Ben uh, is being publicly recognized as someone who, you know, doesn't play a lot of video games, gets out, exercise often, donates a lot of blood, donates his time to charity. He is a model citizen and everyone should, you know, uh, espouse the virtues of Ben. Perfect. But, you know, the fact that so many punishments are built into this and the fact that it can affect everything from your internet speed to your family, not talking to you to job and how and uh, to job and housing loans and car loans, uh, right. all the way down to the level of medical care that you receive. It really is a tool to suppress those who may, you know, speak out against you or just do things that you don't really approve of. It's so much right. stick and seems like so little carrot. So this article here from wired, it goes into much of the topics we've been talking about and you know, uh, but they also say, let's see somewhere down here. 
okay, what does this mean for China? And this is kind of the end result, you know, kind of what we're at here. Saying that the full extent of the impacts is impossible to say simply simply because it doesn't fully exist yet. They said that the reality is somewhere between uh, the government's claims and the Western media's description of a horror-filled dystopia. It's a it's a very like a baby step, she said, uh, of the work that's happened so far. Krista, let's put it this way: if dystopian Orwellian uh, hellscape were a ten. What's happening in China right now is like a three. Like, you know, step three is this. Step 10 is Orwellian horror. Every worst case scenario imagined comes true. Is step 10? This is step three. While it does not guarantee that step 10 will ever get here, it does mean that, hey, you know, you're on the right track. Yeah, you're on the right track for eventually getting to step 10. Uh, They say that it's somewhere between people who say that the media coverage is inaccurate, and that means it's not so bad, and people saying that, uh, and people who see this huge dystopia. You have to find the space between that where you can explain it, uh, explain it is actually quite scary, even if it's not quite the way it's portrayed. Uh, and by the way, this article brought up a very good point that I never really considered. The West, uh, they say that um, often comparisons are drawn between private applications like Uber and its rating system for customers and drivers. So, Carissa, you know about Uber and the rating system that they implement, right? Yes. They have one that, uh, for everyone out there who does not know, they have hidden rating systems. So, you can, and, you know, the drivers are less hidden because you can see what rating your driver has uh you know if they have five star 4.7 star whatever i think anything below like a 4.4 star and you actually get removed from the platform like 4.4 is like the the threshold last i checked um because you know people don't uh people don't rate people on a sliding scale zero to five stars they either do a one or a five star and yeah so anyways 4.4 and you're kicked off the platform and i don't know if you knew this carissa but as a rider drivers get to rate you uh they get to say that this person was quiet clean this person you know kind of paid you know paid and you know they didn't damage my property whatever as a rider you also get a rating that only other drivers can see so oh. I wonder if that has something to do with the cost of your ride, too. Uh, I doubt it. It's it's more of like a behavior kind of thing, more than like mm-hmm. you know, how, how much money does this person spend kind of thing. But it's, uh, again, it's a way for drivers to be able to determine if they want to take someone for a ride. And that's what they're saying. It, it, it's a comparison being drawn between what China is trying to do and what Uber is, is currently doing. Mm-hmm. And while these private company systems are extreme and problematic in this person's view, they are fundamentally different. The People's Republic of China is an authoritarian country. The Chinese Communist Party is responsible for gross human rights violations for decades. And, well, yeah, they were talking about the the, the Uyghurs as well. There's nothing any liberal Democrat society should even think about copying in the social credit system. So, yeah, that was that one author's opinion that this should not be implemented in other parts of the world. Uh, Carissa, we have... Like almost no time left. One other thing, uh, one other topic that we really didn't get to that I wanted to address were kind of the effects of these kinds of policies in China. And they have a number of policies. Uh, We talked about the mass surveillance in China, the internet security law in China that led to a lot of the, uh, a lot of the government being able to look over the data that tech companies are generating in China. And that has led to, uh, Google developing Dragonfly, which is their own search engine specifically designed for China so that they can operate within China. I had an example of Apple. Uh, Apple moved a portion of their iCloud into China so that they could comply with Chinese laws and still sell iPhones in China. But yeah, the Chinese iCloud is not the same iCloud that everyone else gets. It's, It's because Apple has to comply to spot checks and handing over data to the Chinese government. Uh, 
yeah, if again, if companies want to operate within China, they have to essentially move to China oh, the rules. or yeah, the, or or they have to associate themselves with a Chinese company that will essentially uh, give them the clout to operate within China. Uh, sorry, Chris, but just real quick, wanted to also mention uh, some other stuff such as the go out policy, industrial espionage for China, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think that's pretty good. I think we covered that pretty good. Uh, Chris, do you think there's any areas of this that are still fuzzy in your mind? Or do you think that you have a better understanding of what the social credit system in China is? No, I think it's a good overview. And I've, I've got a better understanding of it now. And I think it's really interesting, too. And there's a lot of a lot of implications and possibilities with this whole thing. So we'll just have to see what happens. That's the biggest thing that I took away from this. Obviously you can knee jerk this and say, this is going to be the end of freedom of speech within China, which yeah, you're, that was never really a guarantee to begin with. But a lot of these are implied effects. A lot of these are possible effects, not really in place yet, but it's not, a very far leap to understand where these ideas come from. So that's my biggest takeaway is that, yeah, this stuff is happening. It's not happening everywhere. It's still in its nascent stage. It's still just a baby of an idea, but hey, this baby is going to grow up. And if it becomes a large tentacle, ultra dominating Chinese monster, then hey, the animes were right. Everyone, (laughs) uh, we're done here. Uh, that I think that's it for today's show. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Uh, tomorrow on the program, we have the one, the only, Mr. Nathan Evans, Pop Star Magazine. We're going to get him on. And then on Friday, we're going to have Darius Derek Shani. Everyone, have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning in. Bye, everyone. See ya.